One of Donald Trump's biggest campaign promises was dismantling the Iran nuclear deal, officially the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was signed in 2015 by seven world powers including the United States under the Obama administration. Trump has been consistently critical of the deal, and he certainly wasn't the only Republican candidate to have opposed it. We make that horrible deal with Iran. That deal is a horror show. It's one of the worst I've ever seen. The Iran deal was one of the worst and most one-sided transactions the United States has ever entered into. The deal is widely considered to be one of President Obama's biggest achievements during his administration, and Trump's threat to scrap it has prompted concern amongst the other world powers. To understand why this deal was made, why a majority of the GOP wants to end it, and what the implications would be of doing so, it helps to go back to the origins of both the Iranian regime and its nuclear program. The country first got nuclear technology in 1957, before it became an Islamic Republic, from their then ally the United States, who sold it to help build reactors for nuclear power. The CIA had recently helped dispose the democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh in a coup. Iran's monarch, an ally of the West known as the Shah, took full power over the country and used it to impose secular reform. The Shah increased the country's trade with the West, including purchases of uranium mostly from France and the United States, and Iran signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968. But in 1979, when Iran's 90% Shia Muslim population overthrew the Shah in response to the reformations, this alliance with the West was cut off. The uprising was led by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who was an anti-Western leader who wanted to dismantle the influence in Iran and the Middle East. And he did so by declaring himself supreme leader of the Islamic Republic, claiming Iran to be the leading Muslim state. He tried to help similar revolutions elsewhere, including one of the West's most influential allies in the region, Saudi Arabia. Iran's claim threatened the Saudis who had until then been the leading country in the Muslim world, as did Iran's vehement anti-Western stance versus Saudi Arabia's Western ties. This along with Saudi Arabia's branch of Sunni Islam versus Iran's Shia branch would create a crucial division between the two countries. Iran instantly cut ties with the Gulf states in the West and also unrecognized the state of Israel. The Islamic Republic's hostility towards the West and its allies led to the United States blocking Western trade with it, especially any assistance to their nuclear program. But Khomeini had no real intention of trying to advance Iran's nuclear technology, as he saw it as a step towards Western modernity. Iran's goal of destabilizing the Arab world, most of which was aligned with the West, prompted Saudi Arabia to strengthen ties with the US, the UK and the other Gulf states. Saddam Hussein, who had seized power in 1979, took Iraq into Iran and tried to put an end to the revolution, as well as annex majority Arab regions on the border. This would see the beginning of an eight-year war, with both sides using poison gas against each other. To stop Iraq falling to the new Iranian regime, they received help from dozens of countries who opposed Iran, including the United States, the Soviet Union and Saudi Arabia. During the war in 1981, Iran tried and failed to help a Bahraini militia stage a coup to extend their influence to Bahrain, which seceded from Iran in 1970. After the stalemate of the Iran-Iraq war and Khomeini's death in 1989, Iran was growing wary of two of its enemies in the Middle East, Iraq and Israel, developing nuclear weapons. This coupled with the nuclear arsenal of the West and the secular Soviet Union prompted Iran's new supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei to revive Iran's nuclear program, and Iran was further prompted by the American invasion of their neighbour Afghanistan in 2001. In August the next year, a dissident group known as the National Council of Resistance of Iran publicly revealed two secret nuclear facilities to the international community. After Iran admitting to their existence, the International Atomic Energy Agency attempts negotiations to close them failed. Iran had been using these plants to enrich uranium. Enriched uranium is a requirement in making both nuclear weapons and nuclear power. Iran insisted the uranium enrichment was only to build an energy source, and the agency acknowledged that there was no evidence it was intended for anything but. But American occupation of another one of its neighbours, Iraq, made Iran even more determined to try to get a nuclear bomb. With Iran continuing its uranium enrichment despite the UN Security Council demanding them to dismantle it, the Council imposed four sanctioning resolutions on them between 2006 and 2010, on the basis that this was a violation of the NPT. These sanctions, along with those voluntarily imposed by the United States and European Union, restricted Iranian exports like oil and gas from being sold on international markets and froze the assets of companies involved in Iran's nuclear program. As a result, investment in the country plummeted. With inflation and unemployment rising due to the new financial isolation, Iran responded by continuing to dismantle Western influence in the region, and they did so by sending aid to groups who worked in their favour, aiding first Hamas in the Gaza Strip, the Shia militia Hezbollah based in Lebanon, Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad, and then finally the Houthi rebels who were fighting the Western backed Yemeni government. Iran's support for these groups meant that their influence was imposing a direct threat to the West allies in the region. They also strengthened ties with Iraq after the Americans left, and have since gained heavy influence over Baghdad as the new government became Shia-led. Two different takes emerged from these moves regarding Iran's nuclear program. 
Iran argued that Western influence in their backyard meant that it was crucial for them to be as well armed as possible, with nuclear weapons if necessary. Iran's enemies argued that their support for hostile groups was exactly why they shouldn't be able to obtain nuclear weapons. The US was wary that Iran acquiring a nuclear bomb would effectively end American leverage and influence in the region, as well as possibly prompting Iran's enemies like Saudi Arabia to develop nuclear weapons of their own. With the NPT being violated so easily, many other countries would see the imminent threat and possibly follow suit, something the West has been desperately trying to prevent for decades. So the West have always had a vast interest in stopping Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Despite the sanctions, Iran continued its attempts to build them as well as continued to compete with the West for influence in the Middle East, in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon and Yemen. In response, the West continued to tighten the sanctions in hope of forcing Iran to cut its support for their enemies, but it only brought the issue to an effective stalemate. As tensions rose, the Obama administration was keen to solve the issue diplomatically, as was Iran's President Hassan Rouhani who had been elected in June 2013 and who Obama felt he could make progress with. Obama saw Rouhani as a relatively moderate figure from the Islamic Republic and aimed to strike a deal with him to open up relations with Iran, stop the nuclear development and bring the country into the community of nations. After agreeing to begin talks later that year, sanctions were partially reduced as were key parts of the Iranian nuclear development in what was effectively an interim nuclear deal. The talks were held between Iran, the European Union and the five members of the UN Security Council plus Germany, collectively known as the P5 plus 1. A framework deal was agreed by early 2015 and none of the Western countries involved in any significant internal opposition to the deal. Except the United States. President Obama's party, the Democrats, were almost fully supportive of the deal, whereas their opposition, the Republicans, were much more sceptical. The framework deal also concerned the West allies in the Middle East, who were worried that without the sanctions, Iran's capabilities of destabilizing the region would vastly increase, given that it already had considerable influence over four sovereign countries, even with the sanctions. But on July 14th, the deal was officially signed between all the parties, and the next week, the US Security Council voted unanimously to lift the sanctions on Iran, which would take effect from the beginning of 2016. The deal, effective for 15 years, meant that Iran had to give up most of its enriched uranium, which it required to build a nuclear bomb. Their stockpile was reduced from 10,000 kilograms to just 300. They would only be allowed to enrich uranium to 3.67%, the country would only be allowed one nuclear facility and would have to reduce the number of its centrifuges which enrich uranium from 20,000 to 5,000. Nuclear weapons require natural uranium enriched at 90%, so this would mean Iran would have to cheat in order to build a nuclear bomb. So what's been stopping Iran from just ignoring these requirements? Well, the US has demanded the rights within the deal for the International Atomic Energy Agency to access Iran's nuclear facilities, making sure they're always complying. Any evidence of Iran cheating would result in the international community simply reimposing the sanctions, so it's very much in Iran's interest to stick to this deal. So you might be wondering, why did the GOP want to bring it to an end? This was the same summer that campaigning for the US presidential election took off, and the Republican candidates including Donald Trump wasted no time in vowing to end the Iran deal. As mentioned, they aren't alone as the deal is also opposed by the Israelis and the Saudis. Neither Trump or Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu are opposed to doing any deal, but have been critical of the deal that's been put in place. Both have said the deal doesn't do enough to stop any nuclear development, and that without the sanctions, Iran will only strengthen their militias and try to cheat the deal since the restrictions on the nuclear program only last for 15 years. They've argued that Iran having a nuclear bomb wouldn't just be bad because it gives them leverage, but because they might actually use it. Their case is that Iran's government is equivalent in moral values to many terror groups, since they're more concerned about religious fanaticism than protecting sovereignty. Iran and ISIS are competing for the crown of militant Islam. One calls itself the Islamic Republic, the other calls itself the Islamic State. Both want to impose a militant Islamic empire, first on the region and then on the entire world. Since the lifting of the sanctions, Iran's Yemeni proxy group the Houthis have cemented their control of the capital Sana'a and the Syrian government has taken major strides forward towards a victory in their civil war. Opposition to the deal have also pointed out that President Bill Clinton struck a deal with North Korea to end their nuclear program in the 1990s, only for them to develop a nuclear bomb the next decade. This is a good deal for the United States. North Korea will freeze and then dismantle its nuclear program. South Korea and our other allies will be better protected. The entire world will be safer as we slow the spread of nuclear weapons. So far though, the inspections have reported that Iran is complying with the deal and Trump has failed to get anything passed that could put a stop to it. In October 2017, he officially decertified the deal, but all this meant was that Congress had the temporary 60-day long power to immediately reimpose sanctions on Iran, but by the deadline in December, nothing had been done. So for now, gridlock is preventing the United States from ending the deal. 
Whether the US can make another deal or prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons simply by reimposing and tightening sanctions remains to be seen, as does whether they'll even end at all. The division among Iran's enemies like the Americans, the Europeans, the Israelis and the Saudis could stagnate any process towards renegotiation, but they all generally agree that using dialogue to stop Iran acquiring nuclear weapons is the best option, not just for the dangers that Iran having a bomb would impose on them, but also because of the potential response from other countries. Seeing Iran become a nuclear state could trigger a chain reaction of other countries following suit, but at the same time, seeing Iran go from suffering under economic sanctions to strengthening its trade and ties with the West will most likely discourage other countries from choosing the nuclear option. What the upholding of this deal essentially comes down to on the Iranian side is whether it's easier for them to continue uranium enrichment without the deal and back under the sanctions, or to do so with the deal still in place while trying to avoid being caught. On the other side, while the US technically can't end the deal themselves, they do have the capacity to reimpose their own sanctions on Iran which would effectively end the deal anyway, as Iran would no longer be deterred from advancing their nuclear program. Both sides see each other as unstable and untrustworthy and both could possibly act preemptively based on what they think the other will do. With so many ifs and buts, it still remains to be seen what the future holds for this deal.